we're coming to our uh, fifth and final study in relation to prayer and of course we're looking tonight at the ultimate prayer because if we were asked uh, do you know how the Lord's Prayer begins many of us would say yes well of course we do our Father which art in heaven but we'd actually be wrong because that's not the Lord's Prayer that was the model prayer given to the disciples and it includes for example a phrase forgive us of our sins well that wasn't really relevant to the Lord Jesus Christ so although it's sort of often phrased as, well, this is the Lord's Prayer. It was a model prayer more for the disciples. This here in John chapter 17 uh, is the Lord's Prayer. And he's focusing on what God will do really for his disciples and his ecclesia. Prayer isn't in itself focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is quite inspiring really. And he's going to focus on the fellowship and the unity which he wanted to see, which existed between himself and the Father, which he wanted to see in his disciples and eventually in the ecclesia. So when we come to John chapter 17, although there are several hundred prayers in both the Old and the New Testament, uh, we can feel, I think, the intensity of a priest. Here, the great high priest is already springing into action and he's starting to intercede on behalf of his disciples. Uh, one writer put it this way, he said, without doubt, the most remarkable portion of the most remarkable book in the world. So here we're just sort of focusing right in on some communication uh, that is revealed to us between the Father and the Son. And as I say, there are many prayers, hundreds of prayers in the Bible, but none of them match the depth and the passion and the intensity of this man as he communicated with his Father. So what was the background to John chapter 17? Well, the background is quite significant because while we sit in, in a reasonably warm hall in comfort, of course, this prayer was not uttered in the upper room with the disciples. There was no uh, comfort for the Lord Jesus Christ or air conditioning when he uttered this prayer. He was on the streets of Jerusalem. So it's a prayer also, not only uh, geographically as he wandered through the streets of Jerusalem on the way to the Mount of Olives, it also has an intensity of pressure behind it that we will never feel, brothers and sisters. Uh, this prayer was uttered just hours before the Lord Jesus Christ was going to be brutally treated. It's around about midnight and within uh, nine hours or so the Lord Jesus Christ uh, would begin uh, a terrifying ordeal. So I think when we just think about the, the background and perhaps our own prayers, uh, it's a bit of an incentive for us to, to treat prayers with a little bit of respect because we never know what will be our last prayer. We go through life and we presume that the sun's going to come up tomorrow and, well, you know, things are going to happen. But we never know when our last prayer will be uttered to the Father. So we need to, to be aware of that. We need to make it meaningful. So our Lord Jesus Christ, as he engaged with the disciples in the upper room, came to a point where he said, rise and let us depart. And he stepped out of that upper room, we might say the warmth of the room, into the coldness and the stillness of that air. It was a night of uh, great intensity, as we've said, and we can not fully identify with the feelings of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you can imagine this uh, tidal wave of depression sweep over him, uh, a, a loneliness that was indescribable. His, his disciples didn't even understand what was going on. And as he stepped out of that room and he walked down the cobblestones of Jerusalem, Passover moon shining above him, light flickering through the doorways as people prepared for the Passover, there were the disciples following him, totally confused. Uh, John, perhaps, who was the close to the Lord Jesus Christ, just pensively reflecting on why the Lord appeared so disturbed. There was that sort of wave of depression that seemed to come across the Lord as he described to them that someone would betray him. And there was a, a, an unusual intensity of conversation that had occurred in that inner room that some of the disciples were not used to. And then there was an abruptness, as John records in chapter 14 and verse 31, where the Lord says, Arise, let us go hence. It flows into John chapter 15, where the Lord gives a discourse on the vine. So he probably walked past a vine uh, and made some relevance to that. And so he's on his way up to Gethsemane. He wants to uh, get into that area, that garden that gave him so much comfort, the solitude of that, and he'd look down over the city of Jerusalem as it prepared um, for the Passover. 
And as he do, did so, I like to think that this prayer was probably uttered in the, in the vicinity of the temple. So he's coming from the upper room, he's, he's traversing through the streets of Jerusalem, he's headed up to the Mount of Olives, and as he d does so, he passes by the temple. I like to think that possibly the Lord was in that realm when this particular prayer was uttered. At the age of 12, his focus was on the temple and his father's business. And now this father's business, in a sense, was to be concluded. It was to be brought to a dramatic climax with his crucifixion. And one can imagine those streets that he just stopped there with 11 men and he fell to his knees and he engaged in a verbal prayer to his father to protect and to guide and to help these disciples through the next few hours of great trauma. So it's the father that is constantly on the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we notice that in verse 1 of chapter 17, it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. You know, what is that hour? Well, we tend to think, well, it was the hour of his crucifixion and his trial, wasn't it? No, not at all. Not at all. The hour, as far as Jesus Christ was concerned, was the hour when he would come into the presence of the Father who he loved deeply. That's where the focus of the Lord was. It was gone, he'd already gone beyond the crucifixion. So, for example, Luke chapter 9 and verse 51 says, He came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem. He's already visualising, with excitement, I guess, the, the time when he would be in the presence of his Father. John 13, verse 1 and 3. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, what hour was that? Crucifixion? No. That he should depart out of this world unto the Father. So there's a, a sense of focus as far as the Lord Jesus Christ was concerned. And right through this particular discourse in the upper room, through chapter 14, chapter 16, there is this repeated statement, I am going to go to my Father. So, you know, if that was us, we'd be focused on, well, you know, a few moments I'm going to be crucified, it's going to be terrible, there's going to be a lot of trauma. Jesus' mind was already in the presence of his Father, so we can see the focus on that. And, in fact, that term Father is used 53 times just in, the, in this five chapters that begin here in John chapter 13. He wasn't actually going to, technically I guess we could say, he wasn't going to go into the presence of his Father for another month because 40 days uh, after his crucifixion he was still with his, his disciples before Acts chapter 1 the angels enveloped him and, and, and took him into the presence of the Father. So it's still a way off, and yet there was the mind and the intensity of the Lord, the relationship that he had and wanted to uh, develop in the presence of the Father in heaven. We can, it's just amazing to see the positiveness of the Lord as he goes into the dif this difficulty. Look at the background in chapter 16 and verse 33. The words, the narrative that just precede the prayer. Quite astounding. Chapter 16 and verse 33 says, These things have I spoken unto you, that you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But he says, Be cheerful, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I've overcome the world. Now that is an amazing statement because the Lord Jesus Christ had not yet gone into Gethsemane. There was still a whole troubling experience before the Lord Jesus Christ. There was still the, the brutal treatment that the soldiers uh, would, would execute themselves uh, upon the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the trial of the Sanhedrin, there was the crucifixion on the cross, and yet Jesus' mind is way ahead of all those, what we might term, incidentals as far as he was concerned. So he knew that the next few hours were beyond his capability to control, and so he's putting those circumstances into the hand of the Father. So this prayer is unique on at least three counts. First of all, it's the longest prayer recorded of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's around about 14 prayers of Christ recorded. The average is about um, 25 words. Quite astounding, isn't it? Here is a man who is the closest to the Father, and there are something like 14 prayers, but on average only about 25 words. This is quite a long uh, prayer, and we've looked at the Old Testament prayers of Solomon at the dedication of the temple, and this is, of course, the longest prayer in the New Testament. 
Uh, both, we might say, in length and in scope, because this prayer covers 2,000 years of time. In fact, we'll see in this prayer that Jesus Christ is praying for us in 2015. So he prays for his disciples and he prays for us, us as well. So here he's uh, uh, reflecting on this positiveness. He says, I've overcome the world, as we've said. There's still Gethsemane and darkness uh, there to contend with. In chapter 17 and verse 4 in this prayer, he says, I have glorified thee on earth. Well, of course, there was still the trial of the Sanhedrin. Uh, he was still going to be verbally abused and brutalised. In verse 4, he says, I've finished, i finished, I completed the work. Well, he hadn't at all. He was yet to die on the cross. We might say that was almost the centre point of his atoning work. In verse 6, he says, I've manifested thy name. Well, the ultimate manifestation of the name of God was going to be through the resurrection. If Jesus died and was never resurrected, how would that ever be a powerful manifestation of the name of God? In verse 12, he says, I have kept and I've lost none of the disciples. Well, really? Because they were going to be scattered in the next few moments. How did the Lord have that absolute confidence that the disciples would be held together? It's because of this prayer to the Father. And verse 22, he says, The glory have I given them that they may be one. Well, the unity of the ecclesia was still to be established. Peter was still there promoting himself as the only one who would walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. So there's still a lot of things to happen. And yet look at the confidence that Jesus Christ has as he places all this into the hands of the Father. And that's a, a wonderful position to take as far as ourselves are concerned. Sometimes we don't have that confidence, do we? We get to a, a point, a pressure point in our lives. We think, well, where is all this going to go? Sometimes we need to get to this point that the Lord was able to get to and say, well, it's in the hands of the Father. It's in accordance with his will. So the, while this is quite a long prayer, the structure is really very simple. He prays for himself in verses 1 to 5. He prays for his apostles, a considerable portion of his prayer, verses 6 to 19. And he prays extendedly for brothers and sisters in the future in verses 20 to 26. So we say simple in structure, but profound in its depth. Uh, Brother Roberts in Nazareth Revisited had a, a very eloquent paragraph about uh, the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, there's no redundance of language, no ornamental uh, peripheras, no effort to amplify or impress, no attempt at style, no tragic emphasis, no grandi eloquence of any kind, but the simple utterance of great and powerful thought and fact. I had to look up several words in that particular paragraph. Uh, redundance, of course, means that there's not excessive word, that words that can be redundant in the prayer. Um, periphrasis means to use many words instead of one. So often we'll string out four or five words where we could have used one. Uh, Grandy eloquence means lofty, extravagant, uh, colourful or pompous. So, of course, Brother Robert says when we look at this prayer, it's a beautiful prayer. Uh, it's not just filled with, with, with verb, verbal extras. It's, it's precise and to the point. And he goes on in Nazareth Revisit and he says, what a subject to study. Uh, how can mortal man enter into the suspiration of the Son of God directed to the eternal throne? Again, suspiration, hadn't heard of that before. The word means a long, deep breath, a sigh. So what he's saying is this prayer of Jesus Christ is like this. It's a, it's a sigh. How can we enter into that? Here's God's thoughts who are high above our own. And how can we participate in the communion passing between the man who dwelt in the bosom of the Father and that incomprehensible high and lofty one? Yet we have the prayer before us. How wonderful, brothers and sisters. We love the Psalms, don't we? Because they drill down into the mind of David. And sometimes when we're going through difficult circumstance, we turn to a Psalm. We want, we want to get there because we want to see the emotion and the context of the Psalmist. Well, here it is in an even greater man, our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Brother Robert said, the placing of this prayer on record is a proof of Christ's desire and design that we should be lifted somewhat in its soaring reach. And truly, this is the effect of its frequent contemplation. We have the privilege, brothers and sisters, in going into a conversation between the Father and the Son. How wonderful is that? 
So it's a long prayer, but a meaningful prayer. What about the environment? Well, we've just talked a little bit about the environment, and we've said that the prayer wasn't uttered in the comfort of the upper, upper room, nor was it uttered in the solitude of Gethsemane, but on the streets of Jerusalem. So by extension, this means that Jesus had such an urgent passion to get into the presence of his father that he couldn't wait for Gethsemane. He's coming along the streets of Jerusalem. The disciples are bumbling along behind him, not sure what's going on. And he just feels this compelling urgency. Now, here in the streets of Jerusalem, I want to offer a prayer to the father about the disciples. That's amazing, isn't it? Spontaneity of prayer. Gripped by a desire to come right now, right here, into the presence of the Father. He could not wait to get to Gethsemane for this prayer. Because you notice in chapter 18, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron into Gethsemane. So this prayer is not in Gethsemane. There are at least, we know, three other prayers in Gethsemane that would, ha would have had even greater personal intensity. Why? Why doesn't John, because he was there with the Lord Jesus Christ in Gethsemane, why doesn't John bring forward those three prayers because these were the final moments in Gethsemane? Wouldn't they be more relevant? Wouldn't they be more intensive? Why doesn't John record those ones? Well, he doesn't record any in Gethsemane. He records just this one. Why is that? Because, brothers and sisters, this is our prayer. This is Christ's prayer for us. We learn that particularly in verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but also for all those which will believe on me through their word. This is a, a relevant prayer that connects us to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he couldn't wait for Gethsemane. He prayed then and there in the streets of Jerusalem for his disciples. So we've been talking about good prayers and some of the best, best prayers are those that are spontaneous, aren't they, in our lives. They're very relevant. Of course, we have a routine and a schedule, hopefully, when we, we come into the presence of the Father. But the spontaneity of prayer really adds that intensity of relationship that we need to have with the Father, that readiness to go into his presence when we're perplexed or when we need some comfort or encouragement. And there are times in our lives where we need to, to blend prayers into what's happening about us, the natural circumstance. Again, I remember very clearly um, some years back when we were at a Tasmanian youth conference, uh, one of the girls were on a long walk around Dove Lake in Tasmania. We were back at the buses, there was about 12 buses. One of the girls had a cardiac arrest at the time. Came back to us, mobile phones weren't working. <laughs> Uh, a few of the fellas ran back to tell us and make us aware that one of the girls had a cardiac arrest, CPR was happening. We didn't know what to do. Kids were turning up, we were putting them in the buses. Every bus that I got on, I said a prayer. Because we didn't know what was happening. It would have been disastrous at a conference to have something like that uh, have a, would have a detrimental effect. So this is the idea, brothers and sisters, when something uh, difficult happens to us, we need to not wait till, well, let's wait till 11 o'clock at night, when is my regular time to approach in the Father. It has to happen then and there. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ was involved in. It was a, it was a, a wonderful relationship with the Father. So the great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer. We question that so often, don't we? we say, well, why isn't God answering my prayer? It's not unanswered prayer. Maybe in our lives it's unoffered prayer or prayer that's unoffered when it should have been offered. And we put it off to, well, oh, that's right, I should have prayed about that a couple of days ago. Uh, Paul in Romans 12 verse 12 says, patient in tribulation, continuing, instant in prayer. Well, here is an example of where our Lord Jesus Christ was instant in prayer. Couldn't wait to the Garden of Gethsemane. Third point I want to bring forward is the, the prayer was verbal. Uh, so intense was this private prayer that Jesus Christ spoke it verbally so the disciples uh, could hear it. It wasn't just an in internalisation of the thoughts of Jesus. Now our prayers mostly, I guess we would say, private prayers are silent, aren't they? We tend to just think them through in our head. And I want to suggest to you to have the courage of verbalising prayers. A and most of the time we like to do it when we're alone, and that's true and that's good. Maybe we need to, to search out a, a time when we're away from all the busyness of a household and what's going on. 
But the benefit of verbalising or saying our prayers out loud is we, we, we bring real effect into the presence of the Father. So we're talking in a conversation if, and we feel as though we're talking to someone, and we are. Sometimes when we just uh, mentally go through the process of a prayer, it's sort of like, well, we're disconnected and we, our minds drift off and, well, it wasn't that meaningful anyway. So maybe just have a think about over the next week or so, getting into a practice of taking some time out, going outside, maybe it's a bit cold for outside, or finding a quiet spot where you can actually verbalise your, your prayers. Uh, it was a New Testament practice. I've got here uh, Paul's words to Timothy. Stir up the gift of God with the laying on of the hands of the elders. So the elders would have put their hands on Timothy and verbalised a prayer. And, you know, there's something that's uh, wonderful about that, being able to verbalise uh, prayers. So, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ engaged in that then and there. It was a regular thing for him to engage in a spontaneity of prayer. And as we said, he says, it, it's prefaced by you will have tribulation. So prayer doesn't exempt us from tribulation. Uh, and there's a little comment here that I found helpful in, the, in this book. Uh, and what it's telling us is, look, brothers and sisters, you're going to have a tough time somewhere in your life. You're going to have a big circumstance that you've got to deal with, some trauma, something that takes you off guard. How are you going to do that? Well, Jesus gives us the formula. He says, brothers and sisters, you're going to have tribulation. So this little comment says, what will we do in the midnight of our need when the light of life is gone, things aren't going well, when our personal cupboards are bare? If we've come often to God in the sunshine of our lives, our anxious feet will find the familiar pathway even in the darkness of night. It's a regular thing. We're used to it. Though blinded by disaster, though hounded and hindered by doubt, though confused by a life which sometimes seems out of hand, we can find our way to God intuitively because going to him has become second nature. It's become a way of life. We need to condition ourselves up now to develop a strong relationship with God because we don't know what's around the corner for ourselves. We never know what's around the corner. If we condition ourselves to have a strong relationship with God, then that prepares us for the tribulation that we will eventually encounter. And so here in chapter 17 and verse 1, it says, Jesus lifted up his eyes. Well, I think that's a, a wonderful phrase because that's the whole theme to, for our aspect on prayer, isn't it? Um, looking vertically, vertically in a horizontal world. Well, here it is here. Jesus lifted up his eyes. And this was a moment where Jesus needed to do that. And I'm just going to, you know, again, ask the question, do we do that in prayer? And why don't we do that in prayer? We, we so condition ourselves to look down at the ground, don't we? Uh, here's, here's, an, here's an aspect where the Lord Jesus Christ just lifted his eyes to heaven and he prayed to his Father. And perhaps there are times that that can be helpful for us rather than the, the stance that we traditionally take of our head bowed. Uh, there's a beautiful series of quotations through the scripture where people were in trouble and they lifted up their eyes. Uh, Abraham, when he had a disagreement with Lot. Uh, Moses, when he went to the top of Nebo. Psalmist talks about it and Jesus as well in, in, in John chapter 11. What's interesting is in each of these circumstances, the background is quite distressing, but there is a positive element to it. So for, for Abraham and Lot, there was a distressing conflict. God says, Abraham, don't look down. Look up. Uh, and here's the promise. Northward, southward, all the land that you have, I'll give it to you. Uh, Moses spent the last 40 years in a barren desert. And the father says to him, Moses, it's coming to an end, but lift up your head and look. It's not a desert. It's a fruitful inheritance here. Uh, the Psalms in Psalm 121. Uh, Hezekiah, one of these song, songs of degrees. Uh, surrounded by the Assyrian. But lift up your eyes, Hezekiah, beyond the hills uh, and there realise that you're encircled by the angels of God. And one angel was dispatched to uh, dispense with 185,000 Assyrians. And John chapter 11, Lazarus, uh, a good friend of the Lord Jesus Christ, absolutely loved that family and had to deal with the death of, uh, of Lazarus. And he came there, and there's a very short prayer in John chapter 11, Father, I thank thee, a couple of verses long. 
on a significant occasion that Jesus lifted up his eyes uh, and witnessed to the power of the resurrection. So there's something positive in our prayers. We don't always have to be you know, burdening ourselves looking downwards. Sometimes we can look up to the Father and connect in a positive way to him. And so he says in verse 1, uh, glorify thy son. Used significantly five times uh, in this opening section of the prayer. Glorify thy son. Well, it just doesn't seem relevant, does it? Uh, Jesus is in, in the streets of Jerusalem. It's all dark. He's heading to Gethsemane. The crucifixion around the corner. Where was the glory? Well, it was going to be seen in the obedience of the Son, his character. It wasn't that he effervesced with some sort of physical glory. It was seen in the character and the mind and the attitude of Jesus Christ. John 1 verse 14 says, We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's where the glory was. And the Lord Jesus Christ is, is focusing uh, on that as far as he was concerned. And so a couple of references, First Peter chapter 1, uh, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. There's where the Lord's mind is. And again a bit later on in Peter, we believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. And for ourselves, brothers and sisters, it's not just simply the glory of eternal life, it's the glory of having a character and having those same values as the Father who we love and we admire. That's really what we want, isn't it? Having eternal life is just the icing on the cake. Having a character and a mind like the Father's is what we really desire. That's the glory. Remember, Moses asked uh, God to show him his glory, and he did. He, he, he saw that, not the physical glory of the Father, but the beauty of the Father's character. So when Jesus begins his prayer talking about glory, what he's talking about is the aspect of God manifestation. That was important to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then when we look at the, the wording in verse 2, there's something really strange about verse 2. It says, as thou hast given him. Uh, the prayer suddenly goes into the third person, which is really awkward. As thou hast given him, he doesn't say me, unusual, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he, third person, should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So it's a little bit awkward. We don't, I don't suppose you have, I, I don't think I have, have we ever prayed a prayer about ourselves when we've talked it in the third person? Father, bless him uh, and help him that he might realise when we're talking about ourselves. So it gives us a little insight to the mind of Christ with a couple of points. Number one, it shows how amazingly distant Christ was to his own needs. He's, he's speaking about himself in the third person. Mostly our prayers are, help me and I, I, I need this strength. It's all about I. And, but Christ has almost put himself into the third person as though, well, you know, I, I really want to focus on strengthening and watching over the disciples. Uh, and secondly, it shows that even in the prayer, Christ didn't feel close enough to God as he wanted to. He spoke in the third person. He wanted to be close to God. He didn't feel that full connection. And it's balanced by that beautiful phrase uh, in verse 13. Beautiful phrase, and now I come to thee. So almost this prayer begins as we're in a third person. He feels as though he's distant from God. He wants to come into the presence of the God, of the Father, and he can't wait until he does that. And now I come unto thee. He thirsted to be in the presence of the Father. So a prayer to the Father was not close enough for Christ. He yearned to be in his presence. I wonder sometimes if, if that's how we feel when we pray to the Father. Are we content with a prayer? Most often we are, aren't we? we? We sort of think that, well, that's the climax of the whole day or the climax of our whole spiritual life. We come into the presence of the Father and we pray and that's where we leave it at that level. Well, that wasn't good enough to Christ. He wanted to go further. He yearned to be in the presence of the Father. So the question is, brothers and sisters, do we? Uh, Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4 says, And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, we think about Jesus Christ, don't we? We think about Jesus returning. We think about meeting Jesus, how wonderful that will be. 
But let's go to the next level. Do we have a yearning to come into the presence of the Father? How awesome will that be? How awesome will that be to come into the presence, the divine presence of the greatest being of this whole universe? So that's something that uh, really Jesus was focused on and he thirsted for, and maybe we need to think about that as well. So verse 6, uh, he says, I have manifested thy name unto the men you gave me. Well, manifestation of the character of the Father is where prayer will take us. This is what really we're aspiring to in prayer, isn't it? When we pray to God, we're praying because we know we haven't manifested the character of the Father and that's where we want to be. So Jesus didn't uh, simply verbally teach people about God. He manifested, he, he showed the character of the Father. He revealed the character of the Father. Uh, in the NIV, it says, I have revealed you to those who you gave me. Uh, John 1 verse 18 says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So Jesus, by the way he lived, manifested or revealed the character or the personality of the Father. So the question for us, brothers and sisters, what does your husband, what does your wife, what does your children, what do you brothers and sisters know about God from watching you? From watching you. We all come here, we open up our Bibles, we sing hymns, etc., etc., etc. But the people who are close to you, what do they know about God? What have they learnt about God from, well, just watching you, your behaviour, what you manifest? And that's, a, a, I guess, a question that we have to ask that is very relevant to us because we say, well, God manifestation is important. So fathers, what concept does your children have of God as their father? Are we impatient? Are we inconsistent? Do we take the time to listen to our kids and to give them wise advice and direction? Is that what we are imparting? This is the practicality of living the truth. Sisters and mums, what, what are you revealing to your children as well? Do you teach your children to pray? Because I have to say, I learned to pray from my mum. Because I can clearly remember as a, a young fella getting ready for school so often, uh, you know, when I'm seven, eight, nine, and ten, we'd go buzzing around the house playing chasey, and mum would be in her bedroom praying, knees kneeling on her bed. And often we'd run in there and, whoops, mum's praying. And that was a big teaching lesson for me about the practicality of prayer. So mums, are you taking the time in the morning to pray and are your kids observing you as you pray? Of course, it's not going to change the world. There's still going to be weak bits splattered all over the floor. Just because you're praying doesn't necessarily mean that's not going to happen. But you'll be doing a couple of things. Maybe you'll be teaching your kids how important prayer is to you because how are they going to learn that otherwise? If you're just busy with the morning, bundle them in the car, we're off. Are they learning anything about God? Are they learning anything about prayer? So maybe they will learn something about prayer by that observation. And maybe it will change your attitude to the day as well. Calm you down. Help you take things on board. So, you know, there's a, there's a practicality about manifesting God uh, to our families, to the people we know. It's not all about just gospel lectures on a Sunday. That's not manifesting God at all. And then there's this lovely phrase here. Uh, to the men who you gave me. And this word, if we throw all the words of John 17 into a computer, well, obviously we see the big words come out, focus on God, we'll talk about the world, but this word given and gave is quite impressive as well. Um, the men you gave me. It's, it's used 17 times just in this chapter to show the appreciation that Christ had for the blessings from the Father. More than any other chapter in the whole of the Bible, the word give is a key word right through John chapter 17. And not only that, but importantly, what is highlighted is Christ's appreciation of the disciples. This is quite staggering. Um, one, two, three, four, six times at least, uh, he expresses his appreciation for the disciples. Now, when you think about it, they didn't have a clue what was going on. 
you know, Peter's out there pompously saying, well, Lord, you know, though these will offend you, but not me. I'll be there. And all the other disciples are confused and Thomas obviously doubting what's going on. But Jesus took the time to thank the Father for these men. And in fact, when he comes toward the end of his prayer, in verse 24, he says, Father, the men that you gave me, I want them to be with me in the kingdom. So when we think of the background, you know, these are fishermen, one was a tax agent, you know, they came from a whole variety of, of backgrounds and very difficult circumstances, but Jesus Christ appreciated every single disciple. He didn't say, well, I've got a, you know, I, I like these five or six, the other four, well, I don't know about them. He said, all the men that you've given me, I've appreciated their company. They gave the Lord Jesus Christ quite a bit of encouragement. There are phrases like, you know, when people were walking away from Jesus, couldn't understand what he was saying, and he said to his disciples, you guys are going to go away as well. You know, it was the disciples who said, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Lord, where else are we going to go? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Lord, I'll never forsake you, you know. That just didn't go to the top of the head of the Lord. He didn't discount it and say, well, that's a lot of rubbish. He appreciated the human dimension of companionship in the struggles that he went through. He loved those men. They were supportive of him and he acknowledged that they were given into his, his, uh, his care by the Father. A little bit later on in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, it says, Yes, they were unlearned and ignorant men, but people marvelled that they had been with Jesus. So, what brothers and what sisters have you prayed for in thankfulness over the last week? Because a substantial portion of the Lord's prayer was about his appreciation of the men that God gave to him. So we complain about brothers and sisters, don't we? We say, well, you know, they're stubborn or they're obnoxious or they're argumentative or they're intolerable. Uh, I don't see any of that in the thought patterns of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw these men as fragile, he saw them as exhausted, and he saw them as faithful men and a gift from God. And in fact, he thanked his father so much in verse 12, he says, and I haven't lost one of them. You know, they didn't just drop off the perch and Jesus said, oh, there goes two or three more disciples. Oh, well, what can I do? He said, I love these men so much, I don't want to lose one of them. I don't want to lose single one of these men that are here with me. So what about ourselves, brothers and sisters, when we view those whom God has called? Sometimes we, you know, we comment about one another and maybe it's not, not the right thing to do. When we look at scripture, it's very different. Uh, Philippians 1 verse 3 to 5, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer making requests with joy for your fellowship. You know, this is the Apostle Paul. I'm sure that there are brothers and sisters that didn't see eye to eye with the Apostle Paul, but he said there that he thanked his God for the companionship. Uh, brothers and sisters change our character, don't they? Sometimes we see a thing this way and we think, well, this is how it should be, and then a brother or sister says, well, that's not my experience in life, and that changes us and it makes us more mature. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 14, I've got the Corinth. This is Corinth. We know what was going on in Corinth. It was such a fragmented ecclesia. And Paul says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God that has called you to the kingdom. And we know that a substantial portion of the New Testament is First and 2 Corinthians. Paul spent a lot of time dealing with these brothers and sisters and drawing to them to the kingdom. He didn't just discard them and say, well, you know, they're not worth the worry of putting pen to paper. Ephesians, Thessalonians, Colossians 4, Epaphras says, laboured fervently. That word laboured fervently means he wrestled in prayer. And look at the one in 2 Timothy 1. I thank my God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, night and day I unceasingly remember you in my prayers. Have you ever prayed for another brother singularly or another sister singularly because you thank them for their example and their faithfulness and their dedication? Yeah, this, this is what Paul did. This is what Jesus is doing. Uh, and maybe we need to revisit how we think about ecclesial life. Well, we've got a paragraph there about how we're all different and some of us like it hot and cold and some long, want longer talks and shorter talks, etc., etc. So, well, we're all that. How can we please everyone? Well, we can't. In the end, 
the ecclesia you're in is the one that God has given to you as a gift and to which God has given you as their gift. So we do the best we can where we are learning to appreciate the blessings we enjoy and we thank God in our prayers for their company on the pathway to life. You know what? We hope to be with each other in eternity, don't we? When we're gathered at Sinai, I'm guessing we'll probably congregate together. I mean, who are we going to stand alongside? It'll be the people that we've walked along the pathway of life to. It's the people that we want to see the other side of the, the judgment seat. So, you know, maybe we need to be careful about how we um, complain about each other. And in fact, the Lord gives them some commendation three times in his prayer, very uh, expressively. Verse 6, they have kept thy word, they have received those words in verse 8, and they have the, believed them. So he commends the uh, disciples for their adherence to God's words and principles. And when we think of their failures and their vacillations, which we know are part of the life of the disciples, this is a very kind assessment on the part of the Lord, isn't it? He graciously commends the faithfulness of his disciples. That's how he viewed them. Uh, he commends them for their absorption. They accepted Christ's teaching and they lived them. They wandered with the Lord Jesus Christ for three years. It, that, that was a pretty big sacrifice. They didn't go home at night to air conditioning and say, well, that was an interesting discourse today. I wonder what he'll say next week. They walked with the Lord Jesus Christ for three years. They received his words. Now, that, they were very different. The words of Christ were very different than the traditional and ritualistic teachings of the, the Pharisees. But these men were big enough to say, you know what, Jesus has some important things to, to, to talk about and we accept them. And they gave uh, allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed in the divine sonship. It's nothing to us. We say, oh yeah, Jesus was the son of God. Hey, this was the Jewish people. They were a monotheistic religion. They only believed in one God. So when a man came along and said, I'm the son of God, no one believed him. But these men did. So that's great allegiance. And the Lord commended them for that. And he knew that these men were fragile. Because he says in verse 11, uh, I am no more in the world. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, he could give them comfort and support and direction. He's not going to be with these brothers anymore. So now he has to hand over their care into the hands of the Father because he, he couldn't protect them physically. Over the next few hours, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was not going to have control over those brothers. And so he's telling and asking the Father to look after them. So there's a lesson for us when we can't do anything else. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, we can and we need to pray for others. We're not powerless. We can pray for one another and give each other support. And you'll notice that Jesus significantly is doing this before the event happens. He's praying for the disciples because he knows what the pathway ahead for them is. Our prayers, you know what, ours are on the tail end, isn't it? We look back and we say, wow, look what happened to that brother or sister. That's sad, I better pray for them. Are we perceptive enough to see sometimes where brothers and sisters and maybe young people are going and think, you know what, I'm going to pray for them now before they get down the pathway too far? Because that's what Jesus is doing here. He is praying before the event. Uh, we've got to be humble enough sometimes, I think, when we get into a tough situation, say to another brother or sister or someone, hey, can you pray for me? I need, I need some strength and support. I'm finding the way really difficult. I don't know what to do, but I know I'll, I'll be assured or get some confidence if you pray for me. Ever done that? I've heard, I think it was Brother John McConville, uh, quite often would say from the platform, brothers, pray for us. And it was quite a wonderful expression. So here it is, uh, Romans 15, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, Hebrews 13. The Apostle Paul was humble enough to say, you know what, I might appear very confident on the outside, but on the inside, I need the prayers of brothers and sisters. And don't we all? And how wonderful it is to be able to tell a brother or sister, hey, you know what, I know what you're going through and I'm praying for you. There's not a lot more that I can do, but I understand the pressures you're under and I'm onto it. So, you know, we can, we can be very proactive in that regard. And I know I haven't dealt with any prayers by women, and I'm a bit disappointed with that, because I think sisters, you know, need to be uh, aware that their prayers can be very powerful. I was thinking during the week, 
What do sisters, what do uh, our sisters and our wives pray for? You know, this is a great website. I don't often promote websites, but this is by, uh, she used to be an Amish woman. She's got 40 prayers that you can pray for your husband, I guess by extension for brethren or, or whatever. But, you know, this is a great little website to, to go on to if you as a sister uh, are unsure, you know, what, what can I pray for? And she goes right through her husband and, you know, there's quite a lengthy expression on different aspects that she's praying for her husband. So, you know, if, if, you, if your prayers have just become so regulated that they're boring or they're monotonous, try exploring, you know, prayers for, for brethren or perhaps for, for your husband uh, praying for other people. One of the other themes that uh, emerges quite powerfully in this prayer is the word world. It's used 19 times. Because there's two extremes in this prayer, what God has given to Jesus Christ and what the disciples are going to have to struggle with. And it's the world. It's the influence of the world. And as we know in this prayer, the Lord Jesus Christ prays for his disciples and he says to the Father, I don't want you to take him out of the world. Um, because, you know, in verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil. So when we pray, we don't say to the Father, get me out of here or, you know, vaporise the situation so I don't have to deal with it. We say, we pray, help me through this situation. And how then uh, can we survive the pressures of the world? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ says that in verse 17 and verse 19. It's by a process of separation or sanctification. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Uh, thy word is truth. And so, you know, in dealing with the world, we don't extract ourselves from the world because we're here, we're in this environment, we're, we're in contact with the world. But Christ's point is we don't want to be contaminated by the world. We, we are in contact with the world, but we don't want to be contaminated. And we do that by a process of coming to understand what the Word of God is all about. Paul says in Philippians 2.15, Shine as lights in this world and hold forth the word of life to others. So that's how we do it. And then very beautifully in verse 20, we come to Christ's prayer for you. He says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So he expected the disciples uh, collapse, we might say, to be temporary. He believed the gospel would go forth uh, by the activity of the disciples. So he went forward to the cross knowing that his work wasn't in vain. And we know that he talked to Peter and he said, Peter, Peter, I know that you're going to be under a lot of pressure. But he said, I've, I've said a personal prayer for you, Peter. And when you're recovered from that, when you're converted, then strengthen your brethren. And we always step back and we say, you know what, that's an amazing thing. Unrecorded prayer, special prayer for Peter. Well, here's the prayer for us, brothers and sisters, for you. This is Christ's prayer for you, here from verse 20 onwards. If the Lord Jesus Christ was confident in prayer that Peter could achieve the kingdom, then this verse means that Jesus is confident that you can achieve the kingdom as well, because he's praying for you. It says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. That's you. And that is quite a, a wonderful thought. The Lord Jesus Christ uh, has made a prayer for us and we know he intercedes now on our behalf. So I need to make some uh, comments about how we conclude our prayers because I think many of us misunderstand the, the, the concluding phrase when we say, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, why do we use that phrase? Well, Paul says in Ephesians 5 verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when, he, when we say a prayer, we conclude it by saying we are thankful for the work that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. We have a misunderstanding because many of us think, well, we're praying through Jesus Christ as though he's some sort of filter. You know, there's a pipe, here's the Father and here we are, and he's the filter in here and we pray through Jesus Christ. And as that prayer goes to the Father, it's stopped by Jesus Christ and he gets a scalpel on it and he removes all the inappropriate expressions. He removes everything that's uh, not acceptable to the Father. Well, that'd be wrong. 
Uh, and then we have this other concept that he sort of negotiates or, or, or does some deals with the father because, well, Steve's acting like an idiot, and I know he's prayed, but father, you know, have some mercy on him, surely. Uh, as though, you know, it's through Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ uh, is arguing and bargaining with the father. Is that right? Uh, what would have happened to all the Old Testament prayers then that had no filter? Did, did the Father just discard them? Were they rejected? So it's a wrong concept to think as we finish our prayer, we, we pray through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is going to take that on board and say, well, I, I don't really think Brother Steve's expressed himself clearly. No, I'll dispense with that. That's not going to the Father. So it's, it's a totally wrong concept. The prayer is accepted, and we, we, we conclude it, because of the work that Jesus has done in atoning and reconciling us to God. We're able to offer that prayer. So, what does the phrase, through Jesus Christ, mean? Are we praying to Jesus? Well, no, we're not. John 14, in that day, you will ask me nothing. You don't pray to me, says Jesus Christ. Uh, whatever you will ask, ask the Father in my name. So prayer goes to the Father, through the work that Jesus Christ has done. So, uh, prayer should always be directed to the Father, Christ model prayer. Uh, Christ gave specific instruction through John 14, pray to the Father. Uh, there's not one place in the New Testament where the word prayer or to pray are ever used of prayer to Christ. It's always exclusive to the Father. And so, of course, there's a whole host of quotations there at the bottom of that screen. Jesus Christ's mediatorial work is something that has been accomplished in the past. Jesus, in a sense, is not a mediator now. The mediatorial work of Jesus Christ was done at the crucifixion when through the work that he achieved, it enabled and initiated the new covenant. We're not under the covenant of Moses, the old covenant. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, at that point, he was able to mediate for us, in real terms, a new covenant of life. So we're no longer condemned by the law of Moses. We have the opportunity for life. So when you look at all these quotations where Christ is described as a mediator, it's in past tense. Who gave himself, past tense. By his own blood he entered once, past tense. How much more will the blood of Jesus Christ by means of his death, past tense. So his mediatorial role has already been accomplished. He is now an intercessor. He intercedes through the work of the angels providentially as he directs them and as they work in our lives to shape us and help us toward the kingdom. Okay, so bottom point, Jesus is not interceding against the Father. He's not negotiating with God. He's not trying to work a deal. He is actively involved uh, in our lives. So we need to think about this phrase because we probably have a misconception of it. When we conclude our prayer rightly with the phrase through Jesus Christ our Lord, we are not saying, well, Jesus is going to filter our prayer and eliminate all the wrong expressions. Maybe you thought that. Or that he, he's going to negotiate with God on our behalf. Maybe you thought that. Or he's mediating between two opposing parties, ourselves, which are sort of walking down a wrong pathway, and God, who really doesn't, you know, sort out a deal, Jesus. Uh, or he is vigorously bargaining with God for a better deal. What we are meaning by this when we say through our Lord Jesus Christ is that we appreciate what he has accomplished for us through his death, through what Jesus Christ has done for us through his death, we have access to the Father, that he has already mediated a better covenant that provides an opportunity for life, that Jesus Christ is now at one with the Father and all things are according to God's will. So when we say through Jesus Christ, Jesus and the Father are one and the same. This is the whole point of John 17. So they're not, they're not different, they're not on a different page. This is done through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and he is at one with the Father and that we are thankful through him we can be reconciled by God so that we might be one even as they are one, John chapter 17. So that's why when we conclude we say through Jesus Christ. Not a filter but through a thankfulness of the work that Jesus has done for us. So of course at the end uh, that's the whole point of verse 21 to 23 um, and that's the little key word here, a word that. Uh, this is the whole process. It, uh, when we reflect on how God's work, God works, we've got to be very careful that we don't use erroneous phrases of, un, of unconditional deliverance. So, for example, a phrase like, Father, 
We pray that we might have a place in thy kingdom. That's asking God for unconditional um, salvation. Remember there were two men that said to Jesus, we want to sit on your left and right hand. And Jesus said, well, wait a minute, I, 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 can't, I can't even give that. So when we say, Father, I want to be in the kingdom, or give me a place in the kingdom, we're actually asking for unconditional salvation. We should add the little phrase, so that we might praise or honour thee. So phrases like, uh, we look for a time when we will be in the kingdom, unconditional. Father, we pray that you will grant us a place in the kingdom. Again, unconditional. Well, that, God can't do that. We miss out the phrase that Jesus has uh, put into his prayer, the little phrase, so that. So we pray that you will watch over us and guide us so that we might return to this meeting place and, and, and give honour to your name. We pray that you will bless us with the strength and joy of immortality so that we can serve you in the kingdom. So it's not just an unconditional plea, it's the point of what we're asking the Father for. So we don't have to examine every phrase, obviously, but there has to be a point of why we are asking God for something. So that uh, is, is a little phrase uh, that we need to incorporate in our prayer. And the Lord Jesus Christ does it. So here, here is his procedure. He says, so that they might be one. Shared truth, it's an attitude that the disciples would embrace, that we should embrace. Then he builds on that phrase in verse 21, that they may be one in us. He builds on it again in verse 22, that they might be one even as we are one. And then he builds on that again in verse 23, that they might be made perfect in one. So you can see this beautiful extension of unity keeps on increasing and increasing. He's talking about attitude, direction, a relationship, and finally, destination. So in verse 23, the Lord Jesus Christ says, and as he concludes his prayer, he says, Father, I want you to love them with the same love that you had for me. That's quite an astounding prayer. When we appreciate the intensity that the Father had for the Son, Jesus is asking the Father at that same love, the level of that love is bestowed upon us. So do you appreciate that? You know, we often think, well, Jesus was certainly blessed with the Father, but, you know, I've obviously got restricted blessings. No, not at all. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 19 and 20 says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us? Even the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. That same power we have access to. And so the Lord Jesus Christ uh, concludes his prayer in verse 26 and he says, I'm going to declare your love to, my disciple, to the disciples. And he was, in real terms. So there's an edge of reality to this prayer. And he barely had time to get his breath back when he'd finished this prayer. He barely breathed it out. And there was Judas with a band of men to take him off to the cross. You know, there are no further prayers mentioned by John. Uh, he doesn't comment at all. If you look on, on chapter 18 about Gethsemane, he almost completely bypasses uh, Gethsemane. Uh, this was the one prayer that really powerfully affected John. So I want to finish off with, I don't know how your prayer life is, brothers and sisters, hopefully it's improved, but I want to finish off with a poem and a couple of questions. No time to pray? I get up early each morning and rush right into the day. I had so much to accomplish, I'd never have time to pray. Problems just tumbled about me and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on, grey and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me, he said, but you didn't seek. All through each day I had no time to speak a word of cheer, no time to speak of Christ to friends. They'd laugh at me, I'd fear. No time, no time, too much to do. That was my constant cry. No time to give to those in need, no time to even say goodbye. So at the judgment seat I came, I stood with downcast eyes, for in Christ's hands he held a book. It was the book of lies. He looked into the book and said, Your name I cannot find. I once was going to write it down, but I too never found the time. So, you know, we need to seriously think about the reality of our relationship with the Father and with the Son. So questions to ask. One day I will utter my last prayer. 
will it be a good one? With the pressure of daily events, am I driven to pause, stop and pray spontaneously because I thirst to? Do I have the courage to verbalise my personal prayers out loud to add real meaning to the presence of God? Mums, are you teaching your children to pray by example? Do we pray in thankfulness and appreciation for every brother and sister in our ecclesia? Is there a purpose to our prayer request? Do we add the phrase, so that? Because, brothers and sisters, prayer is not an activity, it's a relationship. 